Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our CARE online talk. Today, we will focus on the Netherlands as the eighth country within our online talk series. My name is Georg Kravitz. I'm head of section International Research Marketing at the German Academic Exchange Service, the DAD, and I will be your host today. Before we start and people are still joining the online talk, please allow for a few housekeeping remarks. We kindly ask to keep your microphones muted when you are not speaking and have your cameras turned off as well. Please feel free to use the chat for questions during the online talk. We will try to pick as many as possible and hopefully can provide respective answers. There will be a designated time for discussion after the presentation of all our speakers. So please, your, please keep your questions in mind. As a more interactive option during this final discussion part of the online talk, you may also ask your questions by turning on your microphone. And in case you prefer to ask a question anonymously, this is also fine with us. If so, please use the private chat option, write to me, Georg Kravitz, your host only, and put anonymous in front of the question. Thank you. There is an individual audience at each online talk. I would therefore like to start by shortly introducing to the CARE project and its current state. CARE stands for Career Advancement for Refugee Researchers in Europe and is a Horizon 2020 and Science for Refugee funded project. In the consortium, the partners are ARCA, Academic Cooperation Association, Brussels, EDUFI, the Finnish National Agency for Education based in Helsinki, and we, the DAD, located in Bonn. The project is running since January 2019 and will end in December 2020. The project's aim is to support refugee researchers through coordinated and tailored provision of information needed for their entry and integration in the research and development labor market within selected countries. How do we try to achieve this? We're developing needs-based guidance and provide relevant information on employment requirements and opportunities in the residence countries. Plus, we disseminate project results to stakeholder networks and a wider community in Europe, including via Eurexis. Our target destinations are 10 selected European countries. In alph alphabetical order, Austria, Belgium, Flanders, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, and the Netherlands, which is today's focus country. Next slide, please. This chart shows the timeline and the main activities of the project and which partner institution was or currently is in charge of respective activities. We are now in the fifth and final stage, DAD online talks. As a result of all previous activities, stakeholder mapping, focus group interviews, and employer surveys, we are currently conducting these talks to share relevant country-specific information collected by all three partners and gather input on needed actions at national and EU level. For updates, we kindly invite you to keep an eye on the CARE Project Twitter account where we will be advertising all project findings. But now please let me share the main and key findings from the mentioned focus group interviews and employer survey for the Netherlands. These group interviews were conducted last year in December and the following main challenges have been identified. Language barriers, as this applies to almost all countries. Different structures and working culture the Dutch research system differs a lot from those in the refugees' countries of origin. Also, the working culture within the research working place, such as hierarchies and working manners. Personal issues that come up, for instance, when he or she is accompanied by the whole family, organizing childcare for all and finding a place to live. There are also personal challenges, post-traumatic stress, family issues when other family members do not find employment or do not adapt easily to the new societal environment. 
social network is always sometimes missing. It is difficult to build up a completely new social network when you're new to a country. So which are the needs and recommendations for researchers with refugee background? More face-to-face -face mentoring is needed to support the job finding and integration process. Another aspect which found the interviewees quite helpful is if mentors would have a refugee background themselves, since they know what kind of issues refugees or foreigners can face when searching employment in the research and development sector. Researchers with a refugee background need assistance also with understanding the system, how to apply, how does a good and reasonable application or CV look like, how to use basic programs, etc. A matchmaking website for connecting employers and researchers was regarded to be very helpful as well. And what are the main findings from the employer survey, which you can see on the right side of the slide? Let's have a closer look. Positive impact factors, incentives for hiring refugee background researchers are as follows. Half of the participants see professional skills, language knowledge of the researcher, and adequate information on support available for the potential host institution as very motivating factors to hire somebody with this background. Social responsibility of the respective organization or company seems to be relevant as well for whether and how the issue of employing a researcher with refugee background is dealt with. And what are the main obstacles? For half of the participants, one obstacle to hire a researcher with refugee background is his or her level of professional skills and the level of foreign language skills that was mentioned as well. Also, recognition of qualifications has a major influence for about half of the participants of the employer survey. If you would like to have the more detailed information, uh, look, we kindly invite you to see and look at both the focus group and employer survey, which we provide on the website of our partner, ARCA, and we'll also put here in the chat. You can also find the link at the end of our presentation, which we are happy to share with you. This brings me to our designated speakers of today, who we invited to reflect on some of the outcomes for the Netherlands. We'll present interesting programs and initiatives and will share with us insights into their work. Mr. Ewing Amadi Salumu is a job coach consultant at the Foundation for Refugee Students, UAF, based in the Netherlands. He will talk about available national support structures and programs for researchers with refugee background uh, and researchers at risk. Ms. Elena Valbusa is a co-founder and project manager of Inclusion which promotes access of students with a refugee background into higher, into higher education. She will present perspectives on how to have access to administrative and research labor opportunities. The third speaker will be Mr. Musa Idris, a junior researcher under training as a PhD student at Maastricht University and the Erasmus Medical Center. And he will share his experiences on his way into the Dutch science system. But let us start with Mr. Salumu. Ewing Amadi Salumu is working as a job coach consultant at the EUF, uh, the Foundation for Refugee Students. In his daily work, he provides assistance and advice to the scholars at risk and researchers at risk who have asked for asylum in the Netherlands. He helps scholars to find positions inside universities and supports the integration. Ewing studied law in the Democratic Republic of Congo and finished his studies in international communication. Before coming to The Hague, he was working as a journalist for many years for the state radio and television in his home country, for the United Nations peacekeeping mission in Congo, and subsequently for research for Common Ground, SFCG, an international NGO specialized in conflict transformation and dialogue. In 2017, Ewing received a peace building award from the UNESCO Department of the Netherlands. He volunteers bridging and promoting dialogue between Rwandese, Congolese, Burundian and Ugandan communities living in the Netherlands. Ewing, welcome and many thanks for joining our group of speakers today. 
then the floor is now yours. Thanks a lot. Um, I do not have videos and I'll try now to talk about what we are doing as UAF uh, in the Netherlands. Um, Can we go to the next slide? Yes, um, me in my presentation, I will try first to talk about the aims, the support that are available for refugees, researchers at risk. Uh, we will talk about scholars at risk in the Netherlands, what support is offered and how can it help the researchers with refugee background and the third time to finish will be how to manage uh, to support uh, what works well and what needs to be uh, developed further. The next slide, please. Now I have to begin and present the Stichting UAF, Universitaire Asile Fonds. It has been created 72 years ago by highly educated refugees and provide assistance for study and jobs. Um, what we do is also um, guide students and uh, uh, researchers at risk. We provide financial assistance. We do lobbying for students and the researchers at risk. And we are an independent organization supported by individuals, private funds and companies. In order to show what we have achieved the last few years, I have decided to go to 2018 and present what was the result of 2018. And we have supported more than 3,000 students um, in 2018. We had a new application, and here you see uh, the number, more than 1,000 uh, new applications. And that year, we had also helped more than 900 um, students to begin with a study in the Netherlands, and we have provided more than 200 jobs. UAF is so big that we work together with more than 100 uh, staff members. We are almost 100, 120. We work um, in all country in the Netherlands and with six region, and our budget for 2018 was more than 13 million. Can we go to the next slide, please? What can we offer to universities and companies? We always offer motivated researchers because we also provide supervision and assistance at the workflow. We train scholars for career development. We do mentoring, as was just presented. This is always something good for um, scholars in order to know how things work in the country. And as I mentioned before, we do supervision on the workflow because this is also needed. This help to understand how is a scholar integrated on the, on the workflow and sometime to understand what difficulties he is facing on the workflow. Can we go to the next slide? Who are our partners? We uh, work directly with NS. Uh, we always work with Aben, Amro, Accenture. We all work. We all we work with all universities, and we also work with academic transfer. Academic transfer help because this is a place where you can find all the uh, vacatur that we have in the country of the Kansas post, you can see it there when it comes to academic post position. Uh, we work with all the universities because as I said, we have to uh, support um, scholars at risk also. And when it comes to scholars at risk, the good place for them is universities. But we also work with Aben Amro, and this is the place where we always work with uh, students. Uh, with NS is always with students, and Accenture is also with students. When it's come to all Dutch universities in academic transfer, this is a place where we try to go and meet people with PhD, postdoc, and all the, the, the people who just finished their master. This is a place where we 
or we uh, um, we give orientation to them. But we also, as UAF, help those who doesn't get a high level education, but they need to find a place in the Netherlands society. And this is what we call the MBO. And we work directly with Stedin, Leander, and L'Oréal. And here is always personal trajectory learning because for six of one years, they will be on the floor. They will work directly with, um, with uh, um, staff members in order to finish and begin the job. In all of this, for example, when it comes to um, the support to scholars at risk and to researchers at risk, UAF always provide financial assistance of 40% of the budget. It means if there is um, a budget for uh, or school has to risk, as you know, PhD in the Netherlands is not a study, but it was uh, taken as a work. So we have to provide something to help them to leave. And the, uh, the universities will provide 60% uh, and UAF will present 40% of the budget. Can I move forward? We also provide the mentoring program for the company. This is very good for scholars. It means we provide staff members of a company who will be directly working with researchers and with students on the, on the flu. In this mentoring, we have been working for many years with ING Bank. We have been working with the Netherlands Bank Accenture, and we are now beginning with Elsevier. As we know, Elsevier is a journal that publishes more than uh, scientific uh, articles. And this is good for our scholars to be directly in contact in a mentoring program with other um, staff members of Elsevier, because this will help them to uh, provide more, um, uh, more insight on the way um, things are moving, are moving on in the, in the Netherlands. We also have a training program. And here we provide a job application training. It means you are, we have scholars are just are coming from, um, from in other countries. They don't know the system. They don't know how things work. And when they come to the job application training with UAF, this help them to understand what they can do in order to be uh, efficient on the, on the, on the job market. They will know, they will receive tips on how to present themselves, how to brand yourself, how to profile yourself when you, ha you have to go to the um, solicitation training, as we usually call it in the Netherlands, when you have to apply uh, for, for a new job. We also provide intercultural communication training. Intercultural communication training here is so important for the scholar. They are coming from the other culture and they are now in the Netherlands. And if we try to compare, you're coming from the culture where it's almost collectivistic, and when you are here in the Netherlands, it's most individualistic. So how do you adapt yourself on the workflow? What is important for you? We know that for some time, women are not, is, is not able for women to talk to people and directly uh, look in the eyes of men, for example. This is a problem. And we have men who are, it's very difficult for them when they have to shake hands with, uh, with a woman, for example. This, we have to come to this and try to present and show how this is important um, for them to look in the eye of people, to shake hands. For example, um, they have to be assertive. You have to be able to say no when it's needed you must know uh, to, f to fix some barrier. You don't have to say yes to everything. So with this intercultural communication, we help uh, scholars to move forward, to adapt the self in the new um, academic culture in the Netherlands. We also train um, our scholars in the LinkedIn training because you cannot do something today without LinkedIn. So um, we try to train them for this. And we always work with, for example, for UFA, Gemeente Amsterdam, 
and um, academic transfer when it comes to um, job training, LinkedIn training, but also use all um, all people inside your app who have been trained to just do this uh, job training, LinkedIn training, or intercultural training. As your app, we always work also with um, HBO students, HBO students, and for this we have partners, for example, do Rafa Meyer, uh, NS, Philips, and Hogeschool van uh, Amsterdam. Can we move to the next area? But what we have found for many years is that it's not easy for everyone to have a place in the Dutch society. For many years, from 2009, 2009 we have been working for working with uh, scholars at risk network around the globe. And we have found that it's not every scholar who had a chance to, uh, to be accepted as a scholar at risk. So we have decided to uh, turn our program and give a chance to scholars who are, who are here in the Netherlands, who need a place, who uh, have talents and who would like to move forward. And then, we have begun with a new program inside UAF that we call Refluchte Wetenschappers. And this can be uh, seen in, um, in English as researchers at risk. And we have two uh, main focus. We have this first uh, junior researchers and we have senior researchers. For junior researchers, there's are academic um, who have asked Asylum in the Netherlands, this is a must. You must first ask um, asylum um, in the Netherlands. And here we help scholars to develop the same academic culture and tradition as Dutch researchers. And this is almost to, for master students who need to continue with PhD. So this is a place if you have someone who have finished um, his master and would like to continue with PhD. So this is uh, what uh, we can do for, uh, for him, is just helping him to move forward, continue with PhD, and this can help him to have a same culture and the tradition as Dutch uh, researchers. We also have this new group of researchers at risk with PhD of with postdoc. They are not uh, coming without experience in the Netherlands. They have too much experience and they bring more in the Dutch Academy, in the Dutch universities. So we work hand in hand with them until they find a job inside um, or outside uh, the Academy in, uh, in the Netherlands. They can be able to work in research center. They can be able to work in the companies, but they can also work in um, inside universities. So we also help senior researchers. For example, for last year, when we found that um, we and now we'll come to this, we are working together with NVO, and we found that not everyone, for example, for the first and the second pilot, there was only 12 and nine. And then we found that more than 67 uh, researchers that was just waiting. They had applied, but they couldn't be accepted. So all those uh, researchers were in the Netherlands and would need to move forward with um, with research or work in, inside companies or work inside a research center, UAF will be there to provide some assistance in order to help them move forward. Can I move to the next slide? And I was saying about the HESTA, um, HESTA program, and this is the impulse for refugees in SIAS. This has uh, been been there for three years and we are now to the third pilot that will begin, will begin soon. And we are working together with NVO. We are working together with Canave, the Young Academy. And what we try to do is always provide all our experience, always provide um, uh, the training, for example, for the new um, 
for the for the new scholars who are accepted as candidate for the Hestia, and we provide a training, we provide assistance, we provide uh, advices, we try to be all with them to help them to move forward. Can we go to the next slide? What is offered and how can it help researchers with refugees background? As I said before. We are doing this career development tips. We are giving them to, uh, to scholars at risk. We are doing, we are giving intercultural communication training, guidance and supervision to ease the integration, language training. And we are, net, we are giving the training and networking and, and the mentoring. We also have in this CV tailoring. And, and then if you needed to see the model of CV, then I tried here to give uh, the link where you can see how many CVs we, we have there. But how this can help you? When you receive the tips and in career development, intercultural communication, guidance, language sharing, networking, mentoring, scholars can be able for himself to move forward. It means you will know how to develop yourself. You will know what are needed when it comes to intercultural communication you will know what can be done um, in order to be uh, efficient on the workflow. Language training will help you. First, you are out of workflow. You have to speak Dutch, for example. We came with this and help you to be able to talk to others, scholars, when, when you are working with them. And then we are also giving this English training English academic training because this can help you to write the good proposal to grow, to write the good articles and you will be efficient you have you will have to produce a good product that can be accepted and when you send it to review it will be easy for you networking is very very uh, important because you will know how to talk to others to present who you are to present what you have as experience and what you can bring in a science in the Netherlands can we move forward how do you manage how do you manage the support what works what works for example for many years we have been able to place 20 to 25 uh, scholars a year for a placement of three years, we good as super uh, good supervision. It also work. Academic English, it always work. Dutch courses is needed, but it was work. And networking, it always work. It's always good. What need to be said? A good personal career development. This is needed inside universities, inside um, inside companies. A good supervision inside university. A supervisor should be always in contact with a scholar who is there placed in order to understand what can be difficulties in order to help them move forward. And the last, and we always uh, understand this for many years, this is a trend now, decolonize the science curriculum. This is also a problem. If you are coming from another country, they have to see you as a good researcher. They have to see the researcher we're coming in as a good one who can bring something in, um, in a science. And this can help people move forward. Can we go to the next? Yeah, this, uh, this was my last point. And I uh, have to thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Ewing, for your presentation and providing us in the audience with useful insight. Uh, we may come back to one or the other in the final questions and answers part of this online talk. Thank you. I'm now turning to our next speaker, which is Elena Valbusa. She works at the at Utrecht University and is co-founder and project manager of Inclusion, which promotes access for students with refugee background into higher education. Moreover, she is also responsible for internship programs dedicated to refugees who want to gain working experience at Utrecht University, both at administrative and research level. So Elena, welcome. And many thanks for being with us here today. The floor is yours. Thank you, Georg, for the nice introduction and also for the great opportunity to present uh, the two programs that we have at uh, Utrecht University. Uh, so I will be which I will be presenting now. Um, so we have um, um, inclusion, 
uh, as first program program to enhance integration on the in the education system. And uh, we have another program um, which doesn't have a specific name. It's just an internship program. And they're all targeted for uh, people with a refugee background. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so as far as inclusion is concerned, that was founded uh, by, by myself and uh, two other people in 2016 in the aftermath of the refugee crisis. And um, inclusion is actually a humanitarian program and um, it offers uh, both refugees and asylum seekers uh, the opportunity to attend uh, courses um, for free at Utrecht University. So this means that they cannot graduate uh, with uh, participating in uh, inclusion, but they can um, uh, get to know the system better. And we see from experience running, uh, we've been running for four years now, we see that this experience enables them to uh, have an easier access to uh, a pre-master program or a master program and, and also to a bachelor program. Um, since uh, 2016, uh, we have had more than 400 students who have attended more than 600 courses. Um, next slide, please. So the, the program is founded on a very, um, it's a very flexible, um, open program. Um, um, as I said, it's a humanitarian program with the main goal is not that they um, 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 enroll in a study program. That's not the main goal, but we just want to uh, give them the opportunity to make good use of their waiting time. Uh, while they wait for their residence permit in case of asylum seekers or in case of permit holders, while they're waiting for uh, their diplomas to be recognized or maybe to, uh, to pass their uh, English exam or Dutch exam. Um, we will move in the next four years, we will move to a, a, a second uh, phase of the project, but uh, up until today, uh, this was the main uh, goal of the program. Um, further, we are flexible and open because we do not, um, uh, people are allowed to enter the program just by uh, a, a simple intake. And the intake is necessary to assess their level, uh, their proficiency in, Engli in the English language and their academic background. So there is no official admission procedure. Um, afterwards, they are enrolled like uh, official students but they cannot graduate. However, they can um, uh, receive, they will receive, if they pass the exam, they will receive a certificate. Um, for the organization, uh, it's a very, um, um, financially speaking, it's a very appealing for an organization uh, because we use what's already in place. Uh, so we do not hire, um, um, teachers, we do not, uh, we use the, 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 the study programs that are already in place, the logistics, which is already, uh, has already been set up. So we use what's, uh, what we have already. And, uh, and this makes it um, um, not too expensive um, and therefore uh, interesting for an organization when exploring possibilities. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also have um, this year in uh, January, 2020, uh, we started a second program um, uh, to enhance the integration of people with a refugee background on the job market. So it's, the, uh, it's an internship program. So what we do is very simple. Uh, we offer uh, permit holders uh, the opportunity to um, uh, run an internship um, inside our organization for the maximum length of six months. Um, as you know, universities are, um, uh, um, they, they, uh, they are worlds in itself with, uh, uh, there are not only faculties, but there are also departments like, uh, you know, uh, marketing, marketing and communication, accounting, uh, planning and control, finances, you name it. Uh, so in these departments, that's where they can have, um, uh, they can gain experience and see how it works. Um, we, uh, the program is very small. Um, we, um, our goal, uh, ambition is to uh, host eight um, 
um, interns uh, every year. Um, as I said, we started in uh, January 2020, which is, which was not, you know, uh, after uh, after a few months. Up in March, we, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, the the shutdown due to Corona, and uh, therefore this was not uh, an ideal situation. Uh, fortunately, we have been able to. Uh, at the moment, we have three interns who are. Uh, uh, running an internship at Utrecht University, and we're very happy that, despite the circumstances, we've been able to do this. Uh, next slide, please. So, what are the requirements? Uh, we ask um, a minimum level of B1 uh, proficiency uh, for the Dutch, la Dutch language. Uh, if they can speak English, um, uh, that's even better, uh, because we are an international organization, and at some departments, uh, um, we speak lots of English. Um, during the, the internship, we uh, also offer an intercultural communication uh, training and also an intervision group, which is led by um, a coach, uh, an internal coach that we have uh, at our university. And towards the end of the program, um, we offer a career counseling. Um, as I said, uh, the program does not offer, uh, I mean, it's unpaid, or oh, maybe I didn't say it, sorry. The internship is not paid, uh, but we want it to be um, uh, a valuable experience that enables uh, people to find a job afterwards. Uh, so that's our aim, and that's why we decided to, um, to use, to employ the expertise of the career counseling department. Next slide, please. Um, of course, um, uh, these programs are, uh, they also present challenges and there is uh, obviously a room for improvement. Um, but in these four years, we've been learning a lot. Um, I would like uh, to, to highlight the main challenges we encountered during uh, these four years as Utrecht University. Uh, well, first of all, as uh, also my, the previous speaker, and also um, uh, Georg mentioned in his presentation, um, language proficiency uh, is always a big, um, a big problem. Um, uh, if you want to study at a Dutch university, uh, you need to speak English as well. And therefore, uh, students need to focus on learning two languages, Dutch and English. And this is uh, a huge challenge, as you can imagine. Um, and also on the work floor, it's very important that even though we are in, um, an international organization, it's very important they can speak um, a good Dutch because that's the language which is spoken on the work floor. Further, um, social and cultural norms uh, from both sides of, you know, the student and the teacher or the employer and the employee, uh, they play, um, um, they can cause big misunderstandings. Uh, so that's why we decided uh, for the internship program to, uh, uh, to use the, um, uh, the, the, the expertise offered by the intercultural uh, communication uh, department. And um, so we see that, uh, for instance, students uh, very often uh, do not know uh, how to behave in the classroom how vocal can they be? How critical can they be to, towards the teacher or towards the, the rest of the group? Uh, that's, um, it's, it's very difficult to understand. That's just a small example. But even on the work floor, we notice that they um, very often, they, they don't know how to, um, uh, what to expect from colleagues, uh, what kind of help uh, uh, to ask or how to address people in an email. These are just small examples. Further, um, uh, governmental compliance plays also a big role in the integration of refugees in the Netherlands. They, um, as soon as when refugees come to the Netherlands and uh, they uh, sign actually a contract with the government where they, uh, um, they promise actually that they will learn the language and uh, uh, that they will, um, learn its habits and culture, and that there are exams which are put into place to, uh, uh, to access this, um, to access their knowledge. And um, combined with uh, uh, their wish to study or to work, 
um, this creates lots of friction. We notice that's at least our experience at Utrecht University as a project manager of these programs. Uh, we see that they, uh, they're very impatient. They want to start studying or uh, working and they see uh, the uh, governmental compliance. So the, the, um, uh, these tests, um, just like you know, a piece of paper that will allow them to go further. And, uh, and, and uh, while and, and we see that, for instance, learning the, the Dutch language is not taken maybe as, serious, as seriously as it should be. And when they start um, uh, studying at the university, they focus mainly on the English language because that's 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 the reality uh, at a university, and uh, and this causes lots of problems afterwards when they are graduated and they need to start to to start using the Dutch language again. Further expectations from both sides, uh, from again from the teacher and from the student and the employee and employer are uh, they play a, a, a great role. We, as a project manager, I see, um, uh, for instance, when they start working uh, for us, uh, that there is, uh, um, they have great expectations. They, uh, they are very skilled. They have a, a great knowledge and they, um, they would like to be able to operate at the same level as they did when they left their own uh, country. Uh, but unfortunately, very often they have to start, you know, from the beginning and this causes lots of, uh, uh, frustration. Um, so there is a mismatch in, in expectations of what we can offer as an organization and what they would, what they expect they would like to receive. And further, I think that um, uh, as a project manager, I see that being able to offer tailor-made support both to students and to interns who work for us um, is the key to success, but unfortunately, we are. Um, uh, that's not always possible, and of course, it has to do with finances and with with times with um, uh, available, and uh, and that's frustrating uh, also as a uh, as an organization not being able always being able to do that, but that would be the key for me uh, if you ask me uh, for um, a successful program and a successful integration, being able to offer tailor-made solutions. Um, the next slide, please. I think uh, that, um, yes, we've reached the end of my presentation and I look forward to our questions later, if there are any. Thank you for the time and the opportunity. Great, and thank you so much, Elena, for introducing us into these programs and initiatives. And I would say, if the same applies to, to Ewing. Uh, practical experiences have played a major role in your presentations, which is always uh, good to see what the work looks like on the ground. It is now time to pass on to our third speaker, Mr. Musa Idris. He will share with us his experiences on how to get a foot on the ground within the Dutch research system. He works as a junior researcher under training, a PhD student at Maastricht University and the Erasmus Medical Center. After he obtained a Bachelor of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Chemistry from Damascus University, Syria, Musa continued further with a Master in Molecular Biology. However, and due to the revolution and subsequent outbreak of violence, Musa had to seek asylum in the Netherlands. He started once again doing a Master program in Biomedical Sciences at Utrecht University and continued further as a PhD student, focusing on modeling colon cancer and parts of the enteric nervous system by making use of stem cells. Before the war in Syria, Musa did voluntary work guiding high school students through their study, life and work. He also volunteered during the first years of the war in supplying pharmaceuticals to refugee camps. In the Netherlands, he received the ECHO Award in 2019 as an ambassador for diversity. Musa, welcome. We're grateful that you could make it possible to join today's online Thank talk. You and leave the lab at least for some time. So <laughs> please take the floor. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, actually, thank you for the uh, introduction. That was uh, quite a uh, yeah, long one. And uh, I would say a full introduction for myself. I wanted to say it, uh, but, but you, you took it from me. So I'm Musa. And uh, uh, in, in photo, you see my child. He, he, he was born here in the Netherlands. And uh, I'm also, I, although I came from Syria, originally I'm from Palestine, 
And uh, after all, here I'm uh, in Netherlands. I'm uh, a Dutch citizen now, after all, and I'm doing my studies in in the university. I also like to uh, have some chess. And thank you for uh, this opportunity to have you all hearing uh, my story. Uh, actually, I wanted to say that since I arrived to the Netherlands, I have uh, three concerns. I had three concerns. My family first, and then my academic study, and then my job. And here I put down my uh, emotional and psychological factors and focus on the study point. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yes. So after arrival to the Netherlands, the thinking about the future was just like uh, thinking inside a black dark box. Is it possible that I become a researcher or requalify as a pharmacist? How long do I need? What should I pay? Who can help? What role can Dutch uh, language play here? Um, I started asking here and there back then, uh, and that ended with one answer at least. Start always with Dutch language. Don't do anything else. Start with your Dutch language. Um, yeah, uh, that's indeed the case for many study programs, but definitely not for research and not for being a biomedical researcher. Late 2015, so after one year, uh, UAF uh, organized a meeting with Utrecht University for uh, medical diploma holders. And it was indeed very enlightening session full of needed information that I, uh, that I used to, to, to start over. Based on that event, I applied to fall 2016 semester in Maastricht, Utrecht and Leiden universities. And I got admitted uh, to a master in biomedical sciences in Maastricht University. And by this, I put my first uh, foot uh, feet on, uh, on the right road towards academia. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, something to mention here. Uh, yeah, was actually uh, very disappointing for me, especially because it came before applying and being admitted to Maastricht, uh, was the response from Leiden University. Uh, telling that you have to be exceptional to be admitted in, in, in a master uh, program. They said, literally, only very few applicants from outside Europe and China have been successful in being admitted. But luckily, after I got admitted in, in, in Maastricht. So, uh, yeah, just to mention this. So the question now, is it always that easy to be admitted to a university in the Netherlands? Uh, next slide, please. Actually not. In 2016, I was 28 years old. This means I'm older than fellow students, but that's not a real problem. However, I was lucky enough that I'm not 30 years old. Otherwise, I would not be eligible for study financing, which is, uh, uh, which is the study loan that uh, the government uh, offers. A friend of mine, for example, has a PhD degree from Syria and worked as a researcher, biomedical researcher there for several years. His efforts to get a postdoc position in the Netherlands uh, failed for two years, so 2015 until 2016. And he decided to go for a master program to requalify again all over from the beginning. So he was in uh, 2016, 36 years old, and he had to combine a full study, full time study, with 32 hours of job for two years to finance himself. Uh, because he is not eligible for uh, study financing. He tried also to get some uh, finan uh, financial aid from UAF, from municipality, from DO, but most of the financial pressure was on him himself. Actually, luckily for him and for his great efforts, uh, he came in, uh, uh, finally to a wonderful end when he graduated cum laude from uh, Utrecht University. So financial issues after the age of 30 is a real obstacle. And most established researchers, at least in Syria, uh, are indeed 30 plus years old. Another point, we think that there could be a shortcut to get your uh, first academic admission. It took me like uh, two years, not only me, but also my fellow uh, researchers uh, like who has refugee background, like two years or uh, or something like two years, around two years, uh, to get to the right direction. I'm talking here about financial information, integration and residential information, uh, and most importantly, academic information. 
so early guidance. Maybe some of you think that, okay, academic uh, information is easy reach, just uh, send an email to any research group or help desk office to get your answers. But I want you to address maybe uh, two points. I came from Syria. Uh, the, the, this is a socialist country. In Syria back then, admission is centrally organized. So you don't need to contact a research group leader beforehand, not even afterhand. Therefore, the mentality that we have should be adjusted to understand the open academic market. Uh, the second issue here I want to raise is actually also uh, speakers before me addressed it, is language barriers. English is, language is barely used in common life in Syria, and I believe many other refugee countries. People who didn't have a plan to travel abroad, not because they are lazy, they, they don't want to uh, study abroad, but you know it's very hard to get a Schengen visa or a US visa to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to continue your research outside the country, so they don't bother themselves learn a lot of speaking, uh, spoken language. And when coming here, Dutch language comes, and it's not easy to learn. So saying this, I emphasize that I was lucky enough, young enough to learn languages. I had my English proficiency uh, certificates from Syria, but that's not uh, for everybody there. People over 40 will unavoidably face problems in language, I would say. Altogether, I started my studies after two years delay, especially when you know that I came to the Netherlands with my diplomas, with my English proficiency certificate, etc. So that's why I uh, want to emphasize on uh, early uh, stage guidance. And now, now I would uh, move forward uh, than admission point. For me, not being an exceptional student, the master was doable. So it's not that hard to, uh, to, uh, to get along at and uh, pass uh, the exams, etc. cetera. Uh, even though, yeah, there, is, there, there are major differences in ways of teaching, exams, internships, etc. Yeah, but that's also uh, my personal opinion in this regard. I graduated in uh, 2018 and started beginning 2019 with my PhD. Uh, I would say quick enough, but there is a story to tell here. Uh, back then, using academic transfer website, I applied uh, in this period to dozens of positions, but that didn't yield anything, not even to meet an HR officer in first selection round. I thought again, okay, is it my bad CV, gaps in my CV? I uh, used HR services in Maastricht University to make a good CV. They helped also writing motivational letters, etc. So I would think in something else probably, okay, is it my age, now 30? Well, there could be something else that uh, I'm also convinced in that we are competing in Dutch labor market. It's highly competitive, lots of applicants for each position. Um, yeah, very fluent CVs, uh, no gaps, many hobbies, bad time jobs, experiences, etc. So uh, that put a lot of uh, pressure on our CVs, uh, especially that, uh, yeah, you know, we, uh, we are under social pressure, distracting ideas that are existential questions over identity, qualification, history, and future. So yeah, that's something I wanted to mention here. But you may ask then how I got my position. Well, I had two opportunities, actually. I got one for my uh, network during uh, my master in UM, in Master's University. Uh, but yeah, that wasn't really my passion. So I went for the other opportunity, which was from, uh, which is the Histia grant from MVO. It's a wonderful grant for refugees for one year, funding of research. And on this specific grant, my PhD trajectory has been uh, based. Finally, I want to add uh, something important here uh, about academic work in Syria. Actually, it's not only research. Academic work for many aged academics, so 40 plus, I would say, can be only, can be, it's not always, but it can be only teaching and coaching. So it's academia, but it's not research. So, so just to give an example, my, uh, 
uh, I have a neighbor in, uh, in Eindhoven in Netherlands. Uh, he is uh, six years old. He is already five years in the Netherlands. He has PhD in physics and still cannot uh, reintegrate in the academia. Uh, of course, there is many. Uh, there are many obstacles here, like his language. He's uh, he's old. He's sixty. I mentioned, and he's out of research field for a while. Although he had been working in academia in Syria until he left. So next uh, slide, please. And that's my last slide. So just to wrap up, finally, I would. Uh, yeah, if I would help here, I would search for qualified people during the first reception in collaboration with COA, not even with municipalities. So, uh, yeah, just uh, look for uh, academics or at least not, not only for academia, but also for, for job uh, market. Make like a database uh, for, for, for those people who can do something somewhere so you can help with your networks. And uh, I also want to emphasize on uh, that most important aid here, which is for 30 plus aged, 30 plus years old aged uh, academics, those need financial aid uh, to, uh, to requalify. And those who are 40 plus years old, then language barrier is really a big one. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Musa, for sharing your personal and impressive experience, uh, a success story, I would say, which with us today. And certainly many thanks to all our speakers. I would now like to open the floor for questions and discussion. Once again, if you have any questions to the speakers, please feel free to either ask now by raising your virtual hand, unmute your microphone and share your question with us. Alternatively, please make use of the provided chat function and put your question in there. You can do so even anonymously. In this case, please write to me individually, uh, Georg Havitz, and put anonymous in front of the question. Many thanks. I have got one question in the chat, which I see uh, by Inet Copin, if I pronounce the name correctly. Mr. Musa, can you repeat the grant you got from NWO to make it possible to do a PhD in Maastricht? Um, uh, yeah, actually, it's the, uh, the, the grant that uh, Ewing has, has already mentioned. It's a Hestia grant, which is uh, Refugees in Science. Actually, it's, the, it's financial aid, at least with, uh, with this round this year. It's the 18 month, I believe, financial aid. Uh, that's not enough to uh, have a PhD, a full PhD uh, uh, trajectory. So I like make a uh, on the handle and like, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I don't recall the right English word, but I just make a negotiation with my supervisor here in the, in the university that, uh, okay, I would uh, go with, uh, with, uh, with you because it's linked with, uh, with a supervisor. I would go with you for this grant, but I would uh, ask for uh, more financial aid from the university. And uh, my supervisor was uh, generous enough. So she contacted the university and they offered me the, the rest of the financial uh, coverage here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm not seeing currently further questions, uh, so I may just uh, jump in and uh, have a question uh, for our speakers in the meantime. The skills and attributes of researchers at risk present significant economic and human capital potential for the countries that host them. However, for such potential to be fully realized in the country, a diverse set of experienced actors must well coordinate their efforts. We have heard so many initiatives, so many programs from you in the, in the Netherlands. I think it's sometimes would it be better to have a kind of one stop, one shop option. So um, what, is your, what is your opinion on, on this? You know, all of you have experienced a couple of years within the Netherlands. Would it make sense to have a more unified or a more integrated approach and put things together so that it might be easy or easier for those who are interested to get the, the right thing at the right time. As I said, one stop, one shop. Maybe one, one of you or maybe all would like to answer. Shall I give it a go? Helena, um, please. 
Yes, I completely agree. I think that uh, that's what we're missing at the moment. Um, uh, but I have the impression that we're moving towards that direction. Um, a few weeks ago, the Ministry of Education has presented uh, a new program for diversity and inclusion. And I don't know the exact insights of it, but they will also address um, uh, the refugee students um, issue or integration on the, uh, especially on the, um, in education, higher education. And um, so I have the impression that we're moving, moving towards a more uh, coordinated approach. Also NWO, which is the, um, I don't know, sorry, the, the translation in English, uh, but uh, which has organized this Hestia call uh, for three years now already, uh, offering great opportunities to researchers with a refugee background. I understood that they will be included in this program and, uh, uh, and uh, also UIF will have a coordinating role on this. Uh, so I see, I'm, I have reasons to be optimistic um, mm -hmm. and I hope that will be uh, the, also the, the way that we will follow in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elena. Is there anything you would like to add, Musa or Ewing on this, on this question? Yeah, I think that, um... If I have to, uh, to take the word now, thank you. Elena, I have just mentioned and shown what um, has to be done now, for example, in this combination when you have an um, NVO, a young academy, uh, and other organization and universities. This help a new future, a new perspective for all the scholars who are here. And this can also help us to see what kind of difficulties all the scholars are facing as uh, Musa just mentioned you, you see what is going on, on the ground, how difficult, how difficult it is to enter in the, in the academia. If we work together, it will be able for us to understand uh, what can be done and go into details in order to help them. When it comes, for example, when to management, my expectation management, for example, from both um, scholars and university, as long as we are not working together, it will be difficult for us to understand what is going on inside universities, for example, because the experience from, uh, from Maastricht is not the same experience from, uh, uh, from, from Utrecht or for uh, Nijmegen. So that means working together will bring more insight on how people have to, uh, to tackle all those questions in the integration of the scholars with, um, uh, yeah, with a foreign background in the Netherlands. And this can open more uh, to them, more, more perspective in the, in the future. Okay, I see, yes. Well, we are already five minutes uh, beyond a schedule, uh, which gives me the opportunity to once again say thank you to all our speakers. I think this was very uh, much insight on theoretical as well as on the, um, as on the practical side, uh, as you have just uh, lined out. So many things need to be taken into account um, from language barriers up to how to integrate into a new environment, be it in daily life and of course in, in academia. So I think there's a lot of information that you could provide to our audience. Once again, thank you very much. Before we, um, um, to close the, the session, I would like to just mention uh, that there are three further uh, discussion or online talks uh, coming, um, one for Austria and one for Ireland. And in particular, I would like to invite all of you to join the online talk from the series, which deals with all the findings on EU level. This will take place on Friday the 20th of November, which is in three weeks time. And we would of course be delighted to see you there as well. In the meantime, thank you very much for joining. Uh, stay safe and of course, uh, keep an eye on you in these very, very special times. And hopefully we'll see you again. Thank you very much.